A man comes to Jesus asking the question, What must I do to inherit eternal life? It seems like a recipe for a beautiful collision. But why does the man end up leaving sad? What goes so terribly wrong? I'm Pastor Jason Barnett, and this is the Dirt Pastorman Podcast. He 
teach you the law. When he comes to Jesus, he doesn't come to Jesus in the open, does he? He comes to Jesus in the middle of the night because he doesn't want his friends to see him there. He comes to Jesus in secret, asks Jesus in secret because he doesn't want people to know he's, he's taught, come conversing with this Jesus. But this young, this young man here, this rich man, he wants to know so bad he doesn't care who's watching. He doesn't care who sees him. He runs and he kneels at the feet of Jesus and he asks him that question of, what must I do to gain into the life? And so Jesus tells him, he says, follow the commandments. He's referring to the Ten Commandments here. He's saying, follow the Ten Commandments. You know what those are. And then he begins to spout some of them off. And the ones that Jesus lists here, these are the ones that tell us to love people. I don't know if you know this, but if you study the Ten Commandments, uh, they really boil down to two. Remember that uh, later on, some of the disciples, or some of the Pharisees who teach the law are going to try and trap Jesus. They come to him and ask the teacher, what is the greatest commandment? What does Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if you study the Ten Commandments, that's what they say. There's a chunk of them that say love God, and a chunk of them that says that loves up, love, tells us to love others. And so that's what Jesus spouts off this thing. He said, hey, love other people. Love others. Don't murder them. I mean, if you, if you murder somebody, it's hard to say that you love them, right? You're cheating on your spouse. It's pretty hard to say that you love them. That's what Jesus tells him. If you want to enter your eternal life, follow the Ten Commandments. Just do it. This man, he, he hears that from Jesus. You can almost sense the excitement that builds up in him in the text here. As he looks at Jesus and says, you know, I've done all that. I have followed these commandments since the day of my birth, since I was, since I was young. I have always been obedient to God's law. I've not broken any of them. And we have, as readers, there's, there's not a whole lot of information about this rich man, is there? This tells us a lot about his life and the things that he's done. And so really based on the text, we have no reason to doubt his claim. He probably has grown up in the synagogue. He's probably grown up listening and, and, and growing in his understanding of the scriptures. He's probably grown up being obedient to God's two commandments. He's not worshiping the other idols. He's not, he's not murdering anybody. He hasn't committed adultery. No, he stayed away from all that. Surely that was enough, right? Surely that's good enough to get eternal life. Verse 21 tells us Jesus look, looking at him loved him. This is one of those moments where when Jesus looks at somebody, and in that instance, he, he's able to look at them and know everything about them. There's another time we see this is in John chapter 4 when Jesus was the woman at the well, right? And Jesus is there to get a drink, and this woman, the Samaritan woman comes up, and, and they start a conversation. And remember, Jesus is able to tell this woman her entire life story, just having met her in that moment. This is like that. Jesus, in that moment, he's able to look at this young, this young rich man and know everything about him. And what Jesus sees stokes a passionate love for him. In fact, the, the word here for love is, this, is, is the verb form of the, the, the Greek word agape, which is that charitable love, that compassionate love, that love that moves for the well-being of others. That's the love that's stirred up within Jesus. Because he, he sees the effort this young man has put in. And yet this man is so far from hope. This man has done, done everything right, yet there's still something missing in his life, and Jesus looks at him and notices that, that there's still something missing. And he loves him. And Jesus, when it said Jesus loves him in this moment, Jesus loves him enough to tell him the truth. Because that's what love does. Love always tells the truth. And I've got Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians 13, doesn't he? In that great love chapter, he says, love rejoices in the truth. This man came to Jesus with the question of what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
And he was sincere in his, his searching. And Jesus had a love. And by looking at his heart, recognizing who he was, says, you know, I'm going to give you the truth because you are honestly seeking me. I'm going to tell you what it is you must have been here in your life. And that's when Jesus tells him, you must go sell everything that you have. You can come home. Go sell everything that you have and come after me. That's it. The very question that this young man, this young man came to Jesus asking, what must I do in the inherit eternal life? Jesus gives him the answer. He gives him the very truth that he came to Jesus trying to get. And Jesus loves him enough to tell him the truth and give it to him. And what does Jesus tell him? Go sell all you have. And come home. It's that simple. To get the, to get the gift that this young man is wanting, all he has to do is sell all of this stuff and go follow Jesus. That's it. That's the only requirement. That, that's the answer to the question he's been trying to figure out. But he doesn't do that, does he? He finally gets the answer he wants. He knows what it takes to, to get eternal life. But he doesn't do it. He gets right there. He's right at the doorstep. He's right there because of Jesus who loves him, who wants him to be saved, who wants him to inherit eternal life. But he's unwilling to take the step necessary to take the earth to, to, to obtain the gift. See, this seems, this, seems, this seems foreign to us because we've always heard when we come to church that Jesus loves me. And Jesus always leaves the 99 to go chasing after the one, right? That's what the page of the scripture tells us. It says Jesus loves us enough that he will leave the 99 sheep to go to chase the one lost sheep. But in this moment, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus tells him, if you want, if you want to return, gain eternal life, sell everything that you own and go follow me. And then the guy gets upset and leaves. Jesus, it sounds like Jesus just let the sheep leave. You know why? Because that sheep wasn't lost. That sheep wasn't lost. Jesus told him exactly what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. It was, and the, the sheep was right there. He heard it. He knew what he was supposed to do. But he was unwilling to do it. And when that is the case, that sheep is not lost. They have made their choice. And notice what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't go chasing after him. Saying, oh no, now I only have 12 disciples instead of 13. He doesn't go begging him to come back. He doesn't go and say, oh, I'm so sorry. That truth was too hard for you. Let me, let me lower it so you can... It can be a little easier for you. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't apologize for the standard being too difficult either. He simply looks at the guy and says he looks at the guy, loves him, and then tells him the truth. If you want to inherit eternal life, sell everything that you have and come home. This man just didn't really want it. He really wasn't after it. If you really wanted eternal life, if you really wanted that gift, you wouldn't have been willing to give up anything to give. But instead, he wasn't. He loved his wealth too much, it says. He walked away. And Jesus lets him go. Because there's nothing else Jesus can do in this moment, is there? What else should Jesus do? Should Jesus zap him with a lightning bolt? Should he lock him in prison chains and say, well, you're not moving anywhere until you say, yes, you're going to follow me. No, Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus loves him enough to say, this is your choice. This is a choice you have to make for yourself. I cannot make it for you. And then he gave him the space to make it. This is like, this is like me as a car salesman, right? Uh, Whenever, you know, whenever a customer would come onto a lot, I said, hi, my name is Jason. What brings you here today? Like, I didn't know what you were there for. What brings you here today? 
And they would always say the same thing. And guess what it was? I'm just looking around. I'm just looking. Okay, that's awesome. What you looking for? I'm not really sure yet. Oh, okay. And then that one thing they would say, well, you know, Mr. Shelton, we don't really need your help. I'm like, okay. Knowing that there's no prices on any of the cars. So I'm like, I'll just wait over here and if you need me, you can find me. And inevitably, they would come find me because they wanted to know the price. That worked me. When you really want to know the answer to something, you'll ask. And when you really want to obtain something, you will pursue it no matter what the cost. But this rich man, that's not what he was doing. So why was his why was his obedience to the law not good enough? Why was it not good enough? And what does that have to do with you and me? While outwardly this man had done everything right, inwardly he was still broken. You see. His heart was still focused on himself. His, his mind was still stuck on the patterns of this world. He said, we don't know much about this church, man. The scripture doesn't give us a lot of detail about his life. But one thing that life has taught all of us, life in, in this world, what this world teaches us through life, is that if you want to get ahead in this life, you've got to work hard. Right? You gotta work at it. You can't just expect things to be handed to you. You gotta you gotta you gotta dig your, you gotta dig in and dig deep and push through. Keep working even when you don't feel like it. You gotta work hard. You gotta you gotta play by the rules, right? You gotta play by the rules that way, you know, no one can talk bad about you that, that they can look at you and say, you did it, you worked hard, you did it the right way, you earned it. And sometimes it helps that you're born into the right family, right? You're born into the right family, that helps a little bit too. But even then, you know, you live up to your family name, your family reputation, you've got to work just as hard as your dad and your granddad did before you. you got to keep pushing. you got to keep doing everything you can to earn your right to have money, power, and influence. That's what life in this world teach you, teaches you. If you want anything, you have to go out and earn it. And that's what this rich young man thought about salvation in Jesus Christ. He thought it was something that you could earn. He wasn't trying to gain eternal life because he loved God and wanted to draw closer to God. No, he wanted eternal life because he didn't want to die. He had worked hard for everything that he had gained in life. He didn't want to lose what he had. He wanted to keep it forever. And so he was trying to earn eternal life through Jesus Christ. He was trying to earn it. He was trying to get it for himself. That's why he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He was asking, what step do I have to do now? What hoop do I have to jump through? Jesus says, most everything that you have, and come follow me. And when he asks Jesus that question, and when he answers Jesus, with, I've already followed the team minutes. He's thinking, I have already bought my ticket. I have already earned my way into God's presence. I have done everything that was right. But he was doing everything right with the wrong attitude and the wrong motives. And that's just as dishonoring to God as if you're running around breaking all the rules. Because there is only one way to obtain salvation. There is only one way to inherit salvation. That gift of eternal life. And that's by having faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. You don't have to earn it. And it's a good thing because
because there is nothing you can ever do to earn the right for God to accept you into his kingdom. You and I, we are so broken and messed up. It's how the scripture tells us that even our righteousness is but filthy rags to God. That means no matter how many good things we do, how much good we accomplish in this life, it will never be good enough to make up what Jesus did for us on the cross. You're never going to earn it. But the good news is God looks at you and says, looks at you and loves you, knowing exactly who you are, and says, you don't have to earn it. I've already bought it for you. When Jesus looks at your young man and loves him, when Jesus sees him for who he really is, what Jesus sees is a young man who spent his entire life striving and struggling to follow the rules, to do everything that was right, to make no mistakes, beating himself up for even coming close to making a mistake. Jesus sees a young man that's tried so hard, that's put in so much effort, and it was all for nothing. Jesus looks at him and loves him because he sees that. He's tried so hard for something that he can't even accomplish on so it breaks Jesus' heart. So Jesus tells me, if you want to be, if you want to have eternal life, go sell all you have and go follow me.
That gift is too vast, it's too wide, it's too great for you, for you to be able to take hold of it with one hand. And quite honestly, it's too large for you to even try and grap grapple with it with two hands. No, it takes your entire being to be able to possess God's gift of eternal life. It takes all of you. That's why you can't hope to hold on to it with one hand and cling to something else at the same time. Because at some point, your love for God is going to be tested by your love for whatever else it is over here. And you're, God's going to make you choose between what's here, between Him, and what's over here. So this rich young man, it was God made him choose between following Him and His money. For you and I, it might be something entirely different. We, we may not, we may hold our check, check books loosely, right? We know, no matter, it doesn't matter how much money you make in this life, you die, all that's going to happen is your kids are going to fight over it. And they're going to spend it all anyway, right? That's what it was down to. You can't take money with you. And all you have to do is look at the Egyptians who built these big pyramids and stuffed all their gold in their side there with them. Only to have people come break in and steal it all. What good was that? That was a waste of time and money. You can't take it with you. So we recognize that. So we don't, we don't, we don't grapple with money, but how about this? How about, how about the place we give our family in our lives? If God told you right now, you know what? I want you to trust your family to me, pack up and move to the other side of the country. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to do that? Because if you can't, if the answer is no, then your, place, your, your love for your family has replaced your love for God. What about your health? Boy, we, man, we watched that this last year, right? In our country. Some people did some crazy things to protect their own health. And not just their own health, be able to, to, to what's the proper way? To keep themselves clean in certain areas, right? To make sure they stay healthy and clean in that area. We watched our world in order to protect that, went out and bought as much toilet paper as they could possibly find. <laughs> they placed their own comfort up here. And, 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 uh, but what if God came to them and said, hey, do you love me more than being comfortable? How about a couple weeks ago? Oh, it was about a month ago now. The gas shortage, right? The gas shortage. <laughs> that was ridiculous. <laughs> You were so concerned about the, I gotta get to work. I gotta be able to, to drive a little building to soccer practice. Because Lord knows he can't walk. <laughs> you look at you, you put tarps in the bed of our pickup trucks, we go buy plastic bags and fill them up with gasoline. What's more important to you? Keeping your life normal and comfortable or following God? Maybe it's your job. What if God looks at you and says, you know what, I know you're making a lot of money right now and you're very comfortable in your, in, your, in your lifestyle. You know what, I want you to quit that job. I want you to come follow me. I want you to go preach the gospel for me. Would you be willing to do that? And here's the thing. Jesus isn't going to change the question because you don't like the answer. He's not. Now, you know, I accepted the call to preach. I was 16 years old. I, I have my life all figured out. I was going to go to college. I was going to graduate. I was going to go coach football somewhere and teach some history. Because I'm a nerd and I like me some history books. That was my life goal. And then Jesus came to me and said, Jason, I want you to give, would you give that up to follow me? I said, God, no, I don't want you. And I fought with him, and I fought with him. 
And I finally, after six months, I looked at me and uh, I told God, you know what, I'm tired of fighting with you, I'm tired of arguing with you, I'm tired of this wrestling match we're having. So if you want me to preach, guess what? You're just going to have to give me an opportunity. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> so the next day, my youth just gave me a suggestion to preach for that street blood service. <coughs> That's what happened. There's been no doubt in my life ever since. Matter of fact, when we went to Serena in Colorado, I got the opportunity to go coach freshman football for a year as a defensive backs coach. And it was a lot of fun, don't get me wrong. I was the nice coach until they stopped listening to me and got mouthy. I didn't yell, though. That's what made it worse for them. <laughs> but I realized something. As much fun as that was, I'd rather be doing this. I'd rather be doing this. I didn't even know that about myself. Because there's peace in knowing I'm right where God wants me. Doing what God wants me to do. There's victory in understanding that, that no matter what the outcome of my life is, I've already won. It doesn't matter if you all come to this every week. It doesn't matter if you get mad and start throwing handles at me. Because I know about being obedient to God, and He's going to take care of me. When I'm talking about God giving you eternal life, it's not talking about giving you everything you want here in this life. It's about knowing that no matter how short you fall in this life, when you get to the other side, you get everything. <clears throat> what is this life anyway? How much time do we have? 70, 80, 90, 100? 120. Maybe we get lucky 200. There's a lot of drugs. That's what a blip on the screen of history. But what Jesus is offering to us is eternal life and faith in Him. He's offering you everything. But the question He's asking you is are you willing to let go whatever it is you're trying to cling to and worship alongside you? Are you willing to let that go? He knows that you want your life. He knows you're desperate for it, but he, he's telling you, I want you to let go of whatever it is that you're trying to worship alongside of me. Because here's the thing, it doesn't matter how many good things you do. It doesn't matter how much effort hard work you put in. You're not going to receive a special check mark or a gold star or a secret pass to be able to bring it into heaven with you. God's not going to make an exception. No, he says, I want you to be able to let it go, trust it to me, and come follow me. Come follow me. I don't think it'll work out well for me. <laughs> no, I gotta take that plan and say, 
you know what, I just did this. I have to let it go. And see, our faulty thinking is, you know, when God's blessed us with this, God's given us this, so we got to hold on to it as tight as we can. But do you realize that is a spirit and attitude of ungratefulness? It's ungratefulness to take God's gift and cling to it like it's owed to you, like it's yours. No, the way you show God that you're grateful is by taking that blessing and letting it go and giving it back to him. Show him that you know, even the blessings you give in this life do not match up to my love for you. So what does that do then? John Wesley writes this. He says, the love of God without which all... What does it say here? I can't do all right. The love of God without which all religion is a dead cur- carcass. In order to obtain this, throw away what it is to you, the grand hindrance of it. Meaning, whatever it is that's standing between you and God, whatever you're clinging to besides clinging to God, let go. Let go. And then you will experience the gift of eternal life. You'll, you'll, you'll receive that gift of eternal life, but also the freedom of knowing that, you know what? Whatever I have is clinging to is in God's hands. The God who loves me, the God who has a plan for my life, the God who works all things together with the other people who love him. But I have to move Whatever it is this morning, can you let it go? Can you quit clinging to it? You say, God, this is yours. I'm going to invite Jeremy and Nicole to come back up. I'm going to invite you to stay over here. We're going to close out the song. And this morning, don't leave your claim to something else besides God. Don't leave your shackle to whatever else it is. Leave your in the freedom of what God gives you. Leave your in the freedom of knowing that you have eternal life. So as we sing, you know, the altars are always open, it's a national church. But if you have come to come from the altar, come to the altars to pray, in your bulletin, there's a little green card that says, Connect card. Pull it out and say, Pastor, I made that decision to let something go today. Put that card out and just put it in the hall and play back there. <laughs> That's all you gotta do. No show. No nothing. <laughs> You are letting go of something and putting all your faith in Jesus. This message was recorded live at the Greensburg Church of the Nazarene, located at 31 Bluebird Lane in Greensburg, Kentucky. Uh, to learn more about us or to let us know that you are listening, visit www.gbirdnaz.com. Special thanks to Buzz Sprout. For hosting this week's episode, if you want more from the Dirt Path, please like our Facebook page.